And hello, everybody. You're very welcome to a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity. I'm your host, John Martin, where I get to talk about uh, all kinds of cool things with cool people, looking at how we can enable the business safely in security. Uh, of course, a lot of that's driven by technology. The business adopts technology and security teams adopt technology to, uh, to help shore it up. We often miss the mark on the human element. And uh, I saw a post online, as most of my uh, most of my episodes are driven by inspiration by others' uh, good work. And today is no different. Uh, Lee Worthman uh, is on with me. Lee, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, you did a good post on uh, whether or not let me pull up the right uh, right title. Our traditional IT roles still relevant in today's modern security org? And it's a thought that I've had for a long time. It's been rattling around in my brain. Uh, in, in the dust and all the other stuff up, up in there, but uh, it, it prompted prompted the thought because I often looked at it purely earlier on from the cloud perspective, which you touch on in your post. Uh, but I think there's a broader broader view here, and we're going to get into some of that today and and look at the role and and the skills of the people and some of your thoughts on that, uh, many of which I share. And uh, I think it'd be a uh, fun. Fun chat today, so I'm thrilled to have you on. Before we get into it, though, a few words about uh, what you are up to, Lee. Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> for those of you that don't know me, um, find me on LinkedIn uh, or, um, you know, I have a blog that, uh, you know, Sean um, is referencing. It's called 370security.com, uh, blog.370security.com. Um, but I've been the chief security officer for Oracle's advertising group for the past uh, about five years going on now. Um, and so, you know, doing all the things security and um, I draw a lot of inspiration for what I write about um, from my current role, but I obviously don't reference my current company because they will get mad at me. Uh, and so my thoughts are my own and not my company's. But, uh, you know, I've been in the tech space, um, honestly, since like 97. You started out writing like web pages and, you know, doing that stuff, went through the dot com crash and the whole, you know, uh, you know, two digits of 2000 versus like, is it going to cause an, you know, existential crash with the whole 2000 thing? And, um, uh, you know, uh, went through that and uh, did networking and um, did some stuff with defense contractors after I got out of the military and then got back into cybersecurity and I've been doing it ever since. So um, it's been a whirlwind and uh, I, I hope that um, my experience as diverse as it is can act as a, you know, as a hopefully a, a guiding point or a lesson for other people that want to get into the industry or at least learn from stuff. And, um, you know, I'm constantly evolving as well. And that's what I try to share uh, with my audience. So um, great to meet everyone. And uh Hope to see you out there. Yep, it's fantastic. And uh, I encourage everybody to check out the blog. And I have to, um, I don't know what the what the reference is. There's a 451 on the badge on this image. <laughs> does, it, does that uh, mean anything in particular or just happened to be a random number uh, on the blog? There's, there are two runners crossing the finish line. Oh, you know, um, I... <laughs> I, I'm not overly happy with that image. I was trying to figure out like a, a metaphorical representation of like trying to represent like how someone's getting left behind, you know, because like that's kind of what right. we're talking about here with the change in the roles is that someone's going to feel left behind as you're pivoting. And the only thing I could kind of get the um, I was using Microsoft Copilot, right? And so they're using Dolly. And uh, I, the only thing I could kind of get it close to like uh, generating something that felt relevant was that running image. And then, of course, it puts in like these um you know random numbers and text and stuff and then i was like well it's good enough you know <laughs> so, so they don't mean anything it's just trying to give you all something to anchor off of and uh, obviously ai still has its challenges for oh, yeah. Stuff. oh yeah because i because i look at that and i think security and i think the analyst industry and that number refer references uh one of the I like how you are going with it. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a hidden message. If you crack the code, send, there you me, send it to me. Right? There you go. I'll tell you what I'm thinking there. Um, but because uh, it, it's interesting because when I was thinking about it, the the analysts, God bless them. I mean, I'm, I'm not picking on them by any stretch here, but uh, a lot of them focus on the tech as well. And uh, and how can the tech over help overcome problems? And I don't know. Some of them do a good job, I think, looking at operations, which definitely ties people in, too. But um, it, it's really about when, you, when you're looking at, at uh, magic quaalude quadrants, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's always about the company and their technology. Um, I think we're seeing that that fundamental shift now, too. I mean, well, if, if you notice a lot of the conversations going on and with like, you know, the SEC guidelines, which, you know, is a whole nother topic. But 
you know, <clears throat> a lot of the security roles that are out there, right, are it's no longer about technology, right? It's about the business, it's about risk, it's about the softer skills, right, of that type of thing. And I think we're definitely seeing that pivot in the industry for the role. And um, I think it's a good one to write about, right? It's a good one to talk about because uh, people want to get into security because it's the cool thing and you can hack stuff, right? And you can learn about all this cool technology, but it's like, that's just one component of it that you need to master. And to be a true good professional, to your point, like an analyst or whatever, there's a lot of different aspects to it. And, and you know, the magic quadrants only capture a certain part of that. They're not capturing, you know, the cost of change or the cost of people or the cost of the technology or whatever it's going to be. Yeah, absolutely. So what, um, what was the catalyst behind this? Was, it, was there a trigger that, that said, I need to write this now? Or is it, was, has, has it been brewing in your mind for a while? It's been brewing in my mind for a while. I think that, uh, you know, there's, journey companies and businesses and organizations are at different periods of their journey. Right. And I'm still surprised, you know, not, maybe I'm not surprised, but there are still companies out there that are still in traditional data centers that I've talked to companies that are like, we're getting out of the cloud. We're going back. We're not happy with it. And so I think that prompts kind of the, the discussion, right. Around like, well, like, what does it look like? Right. If, you know, if you are in a traditional data center and then you go to like a hybrid and then you go to like a true cloud and then you go to like microservices, like, how do I need to think about that as a leader? Because like how you structure your organization, how you up level and design the skill sets and training for your people, how you think about hiring, you know, all of everything kind of follows from the business strategy. And I, it's not something I've seen a lot of people talk about. And it's been like rattling around in my head. I'm actually going to give a talk about it at, um, the Rocky Mountain Information Security Conference along this same topic, because I think, you know, if you're an aspiring CISO or a security leader, like you, you can't just go out and be like, well, I'm just going to hire these, these traditional roles. I mean, I need a network security guy. It's like, well, do you like what, if everything's code, like, do you? Right. And so um, that, that's kind of what prompted it to me was just share my thoughts and experience having done multiple cloud migrations, you know, from, you know, uh, data centers on-prem to the cloud it's not something I've heard anyone like really talk about how their org structure changes and how the skill sets change and things like that. And so I figured I'd just share my thoughts and I'm glad it resonated. Yeah. So I think I, I shared many of your, uh, many of your thoughts as you bring your tech stack over, uh, on-prem to cloud, the, the software basically has different configurations. The way you look at the logs looks is different. The way you uh, ingest the logs, the way you respond to incidents looks different. Uh, talk to me a bit about that chain. And we can also talk about microservices and third party services and open source stuff. Take it as broad as you want. Sure. But what are some of the things that most organizations fail to recognize beyond that? We're going to move this physical thing to a virtual thing in the cloud. Yeah. Uh, so a lot, a lot, there's a lot there. Um, I, I think the first thing to recognize, right, when you're shifting from like an on-prem or data center environment to the cloud is that you're, you're giving up uh, control of that environment. Um, and, you know, maybe some of the financial benefits of like being able to amortize or, you know, um, capitalize on resources for agility and velocity and speed. Um, but that's a trade-off, right? And so like, great, we can get products to market faster, we can do things faster, we can do things, you know, more agilely, or however you want to describe it. But um, there's a trade off there in terms of like, you don't own the network, right? So like most cloud companies, right, Amazon, Azure, Oracle, Google, right, have a shared service model where it's like they, if you're doing infrastructure as a service, right, they are the ones that manage the underlying infrastructure. So you don't have to worry about racking and stacking, you don't have to update you know, the underlying firmware of anything. Um, a lot of times you don't have to like plug anything in, right? You're just there consuming it. So that's great, right? We can consume all the things, but that presents challenges from a security perspective, because like if you're used to like running and controlling your own network, um, you know, you can do a lot of things. You can do full packet capture, you can get NetFlow, you can run your own scans and full penetration tests and, you know, not have to worry about the consequences. But in that kind of cloud service model, um, there's very defined ways to do that. Like you can't just go penetration test like the entire environment without contacting them first. You have a very reduced scope. Same with like packet capture or NetFlow. You can get it, but it's definitely reduced and maybe not as useful as it would be if you had like the full access to your entire network. Um, so I think, you know, it's just changing the mindset a little bit of like, okay, I'm operating in this shared tenancy model. 
Um, I don't have full control. How do I still maintain the security of that? Um, and you know, <clears throat> it comes with a skill set shift as well, right? Because like to your point, if you're going to go to virtual machines or virtual environments or being able to scale up compute, get logs, things like that, great. We can consume all those things. It costs money, right? So do you really want to store like, you know, petabytes and petabytes of logs? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Maybe you don't need it, right? And so I think, it, I think you know, the agility and, and, and getting to the cloud um, really, I think, for companies forces them to become more optimized in terms of like their IT fundamentals. Um, you know, because you're no longer like physically constrained. And so you can do a lot of different things. And then, you know, the other issue I see with like getting to the cloud that people sometimes forget about is like, great. Yeah, we can spin all these things up, but you know, you need to have really robust processes, um, to <laughs> a couple of things, right? First of all, you know, before the virtual machines or your containers or whatever you're doing, get kind of launched, you want to have some, some level of visibility and control into that, because like, if you don't, Everyone's doing their own thing. You have no standardized images. You're going to have a lot of vulnerabilities. We can talk about open source software and supply chain. That's a whole big issue, right? So I think they're, my biggest recommendation to people having done multiple cloud migrations is um, if you don't know what you're doing, get someone in to consult and help you understand. Because if you just you know tell your company like, hey, we're going digital first, we're going to the cloud and let everyone do whatever they want to, it's like Pandora's box. And it's really hard to like rein that in. And specifically from a security perspective, if, if you want to like get in front of like, you know, the CICD, you know, pipeline and put in, you know, software security scans and make sure images are vetted and hardened before they go into production and don't have vulnerabilities, that's all process changes that is very, very difficult to kind of rein in after the fact when you've given people all of this freedom to do stuff. So I'll stop there and, and kind of, you know, we can, we can dive in wherever you want to, but there's like a ton to think about as you shift to this, you know, different yeah. philosophy. I think we're both filling our minds with too much stuff, <laughs> but I mean, it's cool because we, I'm thinking the ton, I'm sure the, sure the folks uh, listening and watching are as well. I want to go to, because you, you list some traditional rules here and uh, as you were describing some of the stuff and I was looking at these roles, I'm thinking, okay, so to your point, somebody's racking and stacking the hardware engineer, right? Building the, building the boxes, perhaps even, um, what do they do instead? Do they, if they're left, if the company doesn't have a good plan, do they like try to slot themselves in? They don't want to lose their job, of course. So do they have to re find a, find a new place in the cloud environment where they become relevant or what happens to some of these roles? You list a few of them in your post. Yeah, I, I think it depends, right? I mean, um, so certainly that skill set is still needed. It just might not be needed within that organization, right? And so the reality is, like, if you're racking and stacking, or you're doing, you know, motherboard design or something like that, you know, that is um, no longer like a physical security or physical thing needed by the company. There's other companies that need that, right? You can go work for those cloud companies, but let's just say you love the company that you work for, you've been there forever. I, I think the honest answer is it's it's a skill set change, right? And we've had some conversations, you know, with our team members where it's like, hey, you know, we're going to this thing, we don't need this skill set. Like we're giving you enough time to learn the new skill set and kind of retrain yourself. But if you don't want to do that, let's have a conversation and we can help you find a place to land somewhere else. So I, I think it's honestly, I kind of put it back on the individual. It's like you know, it is, is this place somewhere that you want to stay and you're open to learning like something new, which might require coding. It might require an entirely new skill set or a fork in your career, or do you really, really love what you do? And if you do, if you love racking and stacking, you love these traditional roles, like there's someone out there that needs that, just not us. Right. And I think that's the, the pivotal conversation you have to have as a leader to kind of transform your business is like, you're going to have to, this is always a challenge, right? You're going to have to keep the business going with what you're doing while slowly like turning over, right? The skills and resources and people that you have to be able to do the new thing, but not so catastrophically that like, you know, you leave the old thing behind and it's, and it's, you know, falling over and you haven't gotten to the new thing yet. Right. So I think, I think it's a delicate balance act. And I, I, I usually, at least for me, have a conversation with the, the team or the individuals and say, Hey, look, this is where we're going. This is enough time for you to get there. These are the things I recommend you do. If you don't want to be on this journey, let us know and we'll help you find a place to land. Can you, can you describe kind of the, the process of the initial move? Um, and what I'm trying to figure out is do organizations 
and I know there's different levels of of uh, shifting, <laughs> right? <laughs> like like re, re, moving stuff over, do you refactor, do you all this, all these different things? Um, what what's your sense? Do do folks, organizations, I should say, they basically kind of lift and shift, or do you see many refactoring applications? Do you see a big move all the way to containers? Uh, so they're not dependent on specific uh, underlying platforms. What um, I think it depends on your org. What what I would say is more typical is what happens is like they lift and shift, right? So like they have a core data set that's their intellectual property. It's easier to stand up the compute and the networking stuff. So you kind of get that fence, you know, that that you know area carved out, and then you move your data over, right? And so you really just kind of duplicate what's in the data center in the cloud environment. And that's that's a learning thing. And then usually what happens is someone gets the bill and they're like, why the heck is this more expensive than like, you know, us running on prem? And they're like, oh, because like, that's not how you do it in the cloud. Like there's, you know, you need to optimize. And so then to your point, then they go down and they refactor their applications. They are really tight about how they, you know, ingest and egress data. Um, because that's one of the primary costs of the cloud is like, you know, um, how you get data in and out of there. And so um, they optimize, right? And then once they optimize, they're like, oh, you know, it'd be really nice if we didn't have to like <clears throat> build a gold image for this OS every time we want to do something. Or, Let's go to virtual machines. And then they get the virtual machines. They're like, man, this is like a pain to, to manage. And we noticed that like, you know, we, we provisioned this you know, whatever, 10,000 core system, but we're only using like a thousand cores. That's not, that's not great. We're paying more money for something than, you know, that we don't need. Then they go to like containers, right? That's like, this is the progression. They go to containers because they've already virtualized. So their apps have already kind of gotten to that. So then they go to containers, much more efficient use of like their compute and their, their resources stack. And, and so I, I generally, what I see is like an evolution as the company matures and gets more comfortable around this uh, cloud digital environment, they they kind of like naturally start figuring out like how to do cost control, how to do optimization, how to use their resources, how to um, get to the next step and be more agile, how to improve their CACD pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I haven't seen a company that's just like magically gone from the data center to like Kubernetes and containers. If you have, uh, congratulations. I think that you've you've leapfrogged like, you know, a lot of, um, you know, the evolutionary step of going to the cloud, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone has, you know, if, if you're a very, very mature data center, it's, it's not, um, you know, it's definitely possible for you to do that, but I, I it's not yeah. typical, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And even less typical, I would think, is organizations that maybe rethink their business processes and the apps that they're using and the workflows that enable them. And I don't know, re redo all that stuff as well at the same time? <laughs> Probably not. Um, yeah. Probably not. I mean, yeah. you know, um, one advantage, right, of moving to the cloud is that, you know, um, there's typically what are called like availability zones or different regions, right? And so, um, you know, you can kind of stage your stuff similar to a data center, right? You can stage your stuff closer to where your customer base is and things like that. But um, a lot of people, or at least I've seen a lot of companies that rely on the inherent disaster recovery nature of the cloud, right? The fact that it is distributed, they're like, well, that's good enough, right? But to your point, like, <clears throat> you know, that's, you know, that's not necessarily sufficient, right, for your application. And the advantage of being in the cloud is that you do have that distributed environment, but you have to do um, a little bit of planning to make sure that your app is going to function, right? You know, because as we've seen, like if, you know, uh, you know, the Eastern region, right, of a cloud provider goes down, like Netflix goes down, right? And then everyone's un unhappy. So, um, you know, this is why the whole like site reliability engineering, like type, you know, of field has come out, right? Because it's like, okay, great, we need to, figure out how we can, you know, have certain services disappear, but still keep our customers, you know, operating and maybe we cache stuff or maybe we have a complete failover or maybe we do something different, right, to make sure that our business is functioning. But to your point, it's it's a mindset, I think, that you need to um, think about how you're going to design your applications to be able to run in this more agile environment that comes with these advantages of being able to you know, fail over or provide customers with faster access or um, lower latency or, you know, better reliability or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So when, when you mentioned SRE site reliability, reliability engineering, um, I, my mind immediately goes to 
the next level perhaps of uh, platform engineering <laughs> where I don't know. I think there's a, a tremendous overlap between the two. Yeah. Um, what What are your thoughts on on this? And we um, I, we're probably kind of steering, as most people do, back to the tech. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, it, bringing it back to the roles and the skills, is there a value for some of the existing roles to apply themselves in the SRE and the platform engineering type of environment, perhaps? Uh, organizations can embrace those things properly uh, to provide value where they're not they're not needed in other areas now i definitely think so right and you know <clears throat> the point of my blog post was that like even though you might not need a dedicated person to do that role you still need the skill sets and so like with site reliability engineering right with your sres you know you need someone that understands the fundamental architectures of how the platform or the underlying infrastructure works so that they can design your application or your business or your site to be able to have that reliability that you want. And so, you know, they need to understand networking. They need to understand load balancers. They need to understand DNS. They need to understand authentication, right? They need to understand all these things that are core technology um, skill sets that typically, you know, if you ran your own data center, probably would be done by a dedicated function or team. But now is a is a skill set, you know, that's a more breadth skill set of these you know specialized roles you're seeing kind of come up as part of going to the cloud so um so yeah i definitely think that the roles are still needed um if we can go off on a little tangent i wrote kind of a follow-up on this one which is um i i wrote an article about like why isn't auto patching a thing and, and i'll tie this back to like the, the sre stuff because like it should be right we should be able to just go and like say don't don't call me right just apply the patches you know, reboot the server, you know, do all of your QA and, you know, um, quality assurance, you know, and quality um, control testing and, you know, all of that stuff that you want to do as part of your dev and test and staging, that should all be automatic. Well, why isn't it automatic? We're still dealing with vulnerabilities. We're still dealing with applications that have bugs and things like that. We're still dealing with applications that aren't up to the latest version on and on and on, right? It's because coming back to, you know, SRE, like the core functions of how to design your application or your business to be reliable, which by the way, is not just a business thing, right? It's like, yes, you want to get money. You want to make sure you're still up and doing the things you want to do, but it's also a finance thing, right? It's also a security thing. It's also a sales thing. And so like being able to think about this from a business standpoint and take uh, the advantages of the cloud, right? And then design your business function to, be able to operate, you know, like Netflix is famous for doing this, right? They had the chaos monkey that would go through and just tear stuff down. And then if it degraded too much, they would, you know, okay, good. We've broken it. We'll bring it back up. And, but they were testing stuff for that, for that reason. I think that level of maturity is where critical businesses or businesses that are really serious about it need to get to, which will have knock on effects to security and sales and operations and customer experience and all that type of stuff. But a lot of people don't think about that. They, they still come back to and say, we're in the cloud. It's it's great. If you know, it never goes down. And it's like, mm, good luck with that. You know. <laughs> so I do think you know, tying back to um, you know the the skill sets, right? If you have people that have this skill set and can come in and help you on your journey getting to the cloud, and can help you do this stuff to up level and optimize and and make sure that your business is going to run even if uh, an availability zone goes down or you have a denial of service in one region or whatever it's going to be, that's a core skill set that's drawing on those traditional skills that are then, you know, amalgamated and slammed into this, you know, these new skills, whether they're site reliability engineering or some other type of role that, you know, um, has been smashed in with these different skill sets. Yeah, I love it. And the, uh, I'm just wondering, cause I, people who listen to the show probably heard me say this before, but I, I feel that organizations spend a lot on transforming something of, of the, some part of the business, right? And a big part of that is investing in, in the cloud and maybe then enhancing their, their applications and improving the workflows and, and really crunching the numbers to get the most out of marketing operations, right? So there's a lot of investment to transform things to cut costs and increase revenue. And I, I feel security gets left out. It's the, 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 I don't want to, you know, redheaded stepchild. I don't know if that's how much time do we have. <laughs> <laughs> I but think that, you're right. It's the perfect you know? time to, 
to do that stuff. I know it to our to your point earlier, it's very tactical. We just want to shift and then we'll go from there. But to me, that this is a great place to look at what's our risk exposure, what what's our real objective with the business and how do we achieve that most effectively in the safest way possible without killing our security and, and surrounding IT organization. So I don't know, any any thoughts on that? I, I think you're spot on, right? I think um, <clears throat> you know security tends to be an afterthought, um, or you know if it is thought of, it's viewed as, as an impediment, right? It's like, oh well, we'll worry about that afterwards because they're just going to slow us down. Like we got to get to the cloud, you know, as quickly as possible, right? But you know, to your point, you're missing an opportunity, and you know, I I don't know. Um, we can get technical a little bit, but like in, in my undergrad, right, I was a systems and industrial engineering. And one of the classes we took was like on requirements analysis. And there's like a famous graph that there, which is like um, uh, basically like there's a there's a line is like an exponential like line going up, you know, like an S curve going up from the from the bottom left up to the top right. And that S curve is showing the cost of change the longer you wait, like on the on the X axis, the longer the time goes on the Y axis is the cost, right? And so like to your point, if you if you wait to do security, like after you've gotten to the cloud and you're many months down the road and you're like, oh wait, we forgot about this, we should do it. You're gonna spend a lot more money up on that curve than you would have if you had just built it in from the front. And, and I think it's honestly a travesty of our profession in that we're an afterthought and you know we're viewed as like, you know, this insurance policy or this impediment when the reality is if we're included at the front, help design these things properly, Really what we're talking about is we come back to the SRE conversation. These are fundamentals, right, of IT operations, of business operations that should be in place anyway to make your business function, but they help security in terms of what we wanna do. Asset inventory, great example. Is that a security issue? No, right? But we need it in order to, in order to be successful, but so does finance, right? So does your operations team. So does like your development team, right? So like, you know, I, I think that um, what I would like to see, or my ideal, my, my, if I can plead to the industry and if I can help in any way is like, if you're going on this journey, right, get involved early, um, and really, you know, help to convince the business that you're there to add value and not be an impediment. Because I think if you can get these fundamentals, right, as you're migrating, um, instead of doing it after the fact, um, you'll be in a much, much better place than, than trying to, you know, rein in Pandora's box after the fact. Yeah. So let, let's, uh, as we, as we start to come to the close here, I'm sure I have a gazillion more questions, but anyway, um, let's bring it back to the roles and the skills and maybe latch on to this point that we were just, we were just talking about as people want to enter this field of cybersecurity, um, coming out of university, coming out of trade, coming out of, uh, hack the box or try hack me or whatever, wherever the, whatever path, um, that they take, uh, and, uh, and others in it or in business that have a desire to, to, uh, enter this field. What would you suggest? And maybe that's two different groups, but what, what would you suggest they focus on to really make a difference? So clearly the, they're going to focus on things that get them hired. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think this next generation that, that enter, be it new folks or adjacent folks that, that have been in the in workforce for a while. I think there's an opportunity for them to help redef redefine cybersecurity and, uh, and bring in some new insights that isn't just about uh, we, we've always been the afterthought. Let's continue to be the afterthought and we'll just continue to go as we go. So what do you think? Yeah, um, a little bit of a history lesson. I'll start with that is that, you know, if you think about how, you know, security functions got started, right? We were a function of IT or an offshoot of IT. And, you know, most security professionals that I've talked to that are, you know, have kind of the same tenure that I have, um, they were sysadmins, right? They were help desk people, they were network engineers, they were, you know, whatever, you know, um, Linux admin, you know, people, right? And so they kind of took all of these different skill sets and then eventually they landed in security uh, and then, you know, that kind of career progression got started. So um, I think my biggest advice for anyone that wants to get started in the industry is recognizing that there's a lot in this field to understand and you don't have to understand it all at once. I'm not recommending you go out and just like deep dive on how the internet works, but 
I think, you know, the nice thing about our profession is that there's a lot of different specializations, right? You can go into compliance, you can go into privacy, you can go into data, you can go to identity, you can go to, you know, technical and offensive stuff and, you know, choose your poison where you want to be. But my biggest advice is that to be as effective as you can be, like never stop learning. And like, you know, if you're a penetration tester and you don't understand how the packets are flowing from your NMAP tool over to the end system, like figure that out, right? Because understanding the, you know, the iOS model is going to be effective for making you a, a better, you know, person and a better asset, you know, down the road. And it's going to make you better at your job. And if we come back to like the cloud model, right? as the business shifts, right? So if you were, you know, really comfortable in the data center model and you went to the cloud, or you're really comfortable in the cloud and you don't understand Docker and Kubernetes and microservices, the more you understand about the, the underlying technology and business processes and regulations or whatever your specific specialty is, I think the more job security and flexibility you'll have as the business pivots to get there because you'll be able to be like, oh yeah, I understand that. There's nothing different here. Or we need to worry about this thing. This is a risk that we haven't considered whatever it's gonna be. So my biggest advice is like, if you're coming out of school or your boot camp or whatever you're coming out of, great, you know, do that thing, land your job. Once you land your job, be a sponge, soak it all up. Um, I'm a huge proponent of like, okay, just cause you're in GRC or just cause you're in security engineering or just cause you're an incident response, like go sit with another team for, you know, one day a week and learn what they do and, and see from their lens and their shoes and, and get that cross training. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll say on this topic is like, I think regardless of where you sit, whether you're in GRC or privacy or <clears throat> engineering or technical or non-technical or leadership, I think, you know, the reality is, um, having an understand of coding and scripting is kind of a, a must at this point in terms of like being effective at your job. And I don't mean that like you're writing some, you know, the next version of, you know, the SIM, but like if you're in GRC, right. And you need to pull a data set and help with an audit, you know, you might want to, you know, write some code to be able to help you do that more easily as opposed to just, you know, trying to do it in Excel spreadsheets. Right. So I think there's a lot of advantage to that. Um, and so that that's what I'm seeing the trend, especially as you go more into microservices and things get compressed up the stack. Um, it's all becoming code and, and to be more effective at your job, um, understanding that will really, really help you. So that's that's my kind of summary of, of, of that. <laughs> I love it. And and uh, I'm going to make you do it again. <laughs> <laughs> this time, this time from uh, the security leadership and executive leadership perspective, because I, I, I think, I think we need to change the way we hire folks as well. Some of the backgrounds they have. To your point, I think coding is necessary, but also logic, business logic is necessary. Uh, workflows and understanding use cases and stories and the experience that users have, be it be it internal employees, be it partners, if it's supporting the supply chain that, that helps you deliver your services, be it the customers that interact with you and your services. So what, what do you tell them in terms of how, how to, I don't want to say if confidently is the right word, but be, be com comfortable, I guess, in changing and opening up how they find new talent as they bring new folks in? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a couple things here, right? Which is, let's just talk about the kind of security leadership side, which is <clears throat> the, the trend that we're seeing, or at least that I'm seeing with security leadership is that, you know, historically the, the CISO position or any of the kind of leadership positions in security have been viewed as very technical or like compliance roles. And okay, like we can, you know, just kind of simplify it, but I, I, I don't think that that is anywhere near accurate, nor is that where the industry is going um, from a regulatory standpoint or from a business standpoint. And I think, you know, if, if, if anyone aspires to be in a leadership role, regardless of what your specialization is, or if you want to be a CISO, you have to understand the business fundamentals. And I liken this back to, you know, the military, which is, you know, if anyone was a Marine or understands the Marines, they have the saying of every, every, you know, every Marine is a rifleman in the Navy, right? Um, where I was at, um, everyone gets kind of like their surface warfare pan or some sort of designator. Really all that is, is that you spent time to understand the rest of the, the business or the unit 
um, to be more effective as you know a sailor or a soldier or a marine, right? So similarly with leadership, I think that that's really critically important. How does HR work? How does finance work? How does you know how do all these things work? And if you don't have that, like I just don't think you're going to be successful going forward. So to come back to your original question, is like, well, what do we need to look for? So <clears throat> what I look for now in 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 the roles that I look for is I try to keep the role like the the job description very very open, right? So I'm not asking for uh, degrees necessarily because I don't think that that necessarily represents you know the skill set of someone. I'd rather hire for aptitude and attitude than hire for like technical skill set. Um, but you know we try to uh, at least I try to um, flavor my my job descriptions to have like here's what you will be doing, here's what we expect you to do, and not like a the laundry list of like every technical certification and every protocol and everything like that. Um, the challenge is, is I'm finding, right, is that like if you want someone that's a DevSecOps engineer or you want someone that uh, understands Kubernetes and Docker and microservices, if you want an application security engineer or a really good, you know, offensive, you know, security or threat hunter or penetration tester, those skills are in exceptionally high demand, right? And so <clears throat> you have to kind of craft your uh, resume or your job description in a way that is going to get people to you know come and join you um, and be descriptive. And you got to be willing to move very very quickly on it. So, yeah, fantastically. Ah, uh, boy, I feel we could keep going for hours on this. Um, yeah, well, let's do another one if you want to <laughs> break it up. You know, multi part series. I think I think we should. I think we should maybe maybe a dive into some of the different roles. Uh, we're yeah, that'd as be great. Well. Um, yeah, well, let's let's do this. I'm going to encourage everybody. You said you have a follow up to this, so please share that link with me as well. I'm going to I'll include both of those in the show notes. Sure. And uh, yeah, folks should check check out the the blog that Lee puts together. And um, you're very welcome back anytime. Of course, uh, this is an area that I love to talk about. Anything around platform and engineering and and uh, security operations and all back to the business is fun for fun for fun stuff for me definitely um any final thoughts before we wrap um you know uh just for the audience uh you know keep learning and, and keep doing what you're doing keep fighting the good fight and uh you know i think um i'm i'm really pleased with where the the industry is going and i think we have a great community and you know continue to be a part of it and continue to participate and thanks for listening yeah and thanks for giving back to the community through your through your post and joining me here on this. Thanks everybody for listening to this episode of redefining cybersecurity. I think we did a bit of that today and uh, very grateful for Lee helping me do that. Uh, appreciate you all listening. Please do share, subscribe and uh, all the other fun stuff. If you have something to say, think something differently about what we talked about today, please do comment. And Lee, I'm going to close with a congratulations. And uh, it's for something we didn't talk about. And I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave it at that. And if somebody, if somebody can guess, uh, I'll give them give them a high five when I see them. What what it was that we didn't talk about that I think everywhere else does <laughs> has <laughs> has talked about on every other episode. So, anyway, thanks everybody. Thanks, Lee. See ya. All right. Bye bye.